Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm glad that you've joined me today for another video at It Pays to Fear God, where of course we talk about God Almighty, His beloved Son Jesus Christ, and their kingdom purpose, which are the three most important subjects we can ever study the scriptures to understand, as Christ said in His prayer to God Almighty in John chapter 17, verse 3. In this video, I decided to briefly talk a bit about how we can develop friendship or a relationship with God Almighty and how that process really works under the caption or title, God's Unique Friends. When you study the scriptures or just look at some of the biblical figures we see, you find people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Hezekiah, Josiah, Jesus Christ, and so on. These righteous people. And what you notice about them is how close they seem to be to God. That bond, that relationship, that special kind of thing that they have with God that makes them to get certain privileges, to make certain big things happen. Sometimes we just tend to wonder how these people really get so close to God, how they can achieve such a strong and great relationship. And honestly, it's a good thing to wonder about. It's a great question to ask. And in this video, I just want to tell you briefly about a few things that make certain people get very close to God. And after I go over those things, I will then go into three steps that we should take if we desire that kind of relationship with God for ourselves. So in this video, I'll be giving you four things that tend to make certain people become friends of God. The first thing that makes certain people get very close to God or have a strong bond is that they understand who God Almighty is. To understand God is a little bit more than knowing that He's God, He's Jehovah, and He lives in heaven and so on. Those are just basic stuff. It's kind of like knowing how old someone is or whether they have siblings or not, right? Basic facts, but they don't really tell you who that person actually is. But for example, if you want to become friends with a human being, you get to know their personality, you get to know their life goals, you get to know their mindset, their views, how they think about things, then you can actually have a good friendship or relationship with them because you kind of know their mind somehow. So when we want to build a relationship or friendship with God, that is really the first thing to consider. It's that first thing that makes certain people get close to God. They know God's mind. They know what God Almighty likes and doesn't like, what he thinks at every given time. And if you look at Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, God Almighty was inviting us to kind of understand who he is and build a relationship with him from that way. He said, Come now, and let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If we read Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. It is by understanding who God is, his mindset and so on, that we can use that understanding to begin to do what God wants. For example, look at Hezekiah. Hezekiah was obviously a friend of God. And if you look at his prayer in Isaiah chapter 38, verse 3, you can see that he was praying to God to deliver him from the sickness that God sent Isaiah, the son of Amos, to tell him he would die from. He told him, say your house in order, because that sickness you are suffering, you are going to die from it. Then Hezekiah went to God and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth, and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. The reason why Hezekiah could be so confident about the fact that he did what God wanted was because he knew in the first place what God wanted him to do. So when we have that kind of confidence based on our understanding of who God is, then we can begin to make those kinds of negotiations that, for example, someone like Hezekiah had made. If you also look at Moses, Moses was a very big and significant prophet in Israel's history. And if you look at 
Exodus chapter 32 verses 9 to 14 and Numbers chapter 14 verses 13 to 19, you see two instances where Moses had spoken with God. And you can see from the way he spoke and from the things he said that he wasn't talking to someone he didn't know. He understood who God Almighty was. In both accounts, he was making intercession or praying on behalf of Israel because on both times, God wanted to disinherit them because they had offended him by their evil ways. In the first account, it was idolatry. In the second account, it was outright disobedience and rebellion. Moses, being their leader, went to pray to God on their behalf. And if you look at what he said, he reminded God about the covenant he made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he told them about what the Egyptians would say about the matter and how God being the sovereign, he wouldn't want to hear such things. And also about how God is merciful, kind, long-suffering, forgiving, and so on. And he used that to kind of reason with God as you know, God was talking about in the text previously cited, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. And because God Almighty saw that Moses understood who he was, he could reason with him and say, okay, because you said so, I will not do what I said I would do to them. So it's based on our understanding of Scripture and our understanding of who he is that we can begin to speak with him in that matter. Now, the second thing that makes certain people get really close to God or to become God's close and unique friends is on the subject of trust. Trust is almost number one in friendships, relationships, any kind of bond. If you ask people, oh, do I trust this person? And they are actually friends, they'll say, yes, I trust this person. Because ultimately, it's trust that is, I can rely on you and you can rely on me. That makes a relationship to really be strong. And if you look at the Bible, you can see that there were certain people who God could trust. He was confident in their abilities and so they could have a good relationship. Look at Abraham. Abraham is actually a very special example concerning friendship because he was specifically called the friend of God. If we read Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, and James chapter 2, verse 23. What made him deserve that title? Well, if we look at Genesis chapter 18, verses 17 to 19, you can see what God Almighty said about Abraham when he was kind of thinking to himself whether he should tell him about what he was going to do to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because his nephew Lot was living there. He told himself, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? Then what he said next is important. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. The reason why... God could say something like that of a human being, of Abraham, was because based on what Abraham had been doing and based on the relationship that they'd been able to build from the time God met him till that point, he knew that Abraham would be able to raise his children properly. He would be able to pass the baton from himself to Isaac. And as we read in the scriptures, Isaac was able to pass it to Jacob so that Jacob, with his whole family, 70 souls in total, could go into Egypt, remain there for 400 years before they'd be a nation and God would fulfill the promises he made to Abraham. All that was possible because God could trust Abraham to do his part in, of course, you know, making all that possible. And if you look at Psalm 106 verse 3, the psalmist described how those who God Almighty can trust those who God Almighty will bless are those who do what is right before God at all times. Because it's that clean and pure record that builds trust. He said, blessed are they that keep judgment and he that doeth righteousness at all times. If read Psalms chapter 106 verse 3. And it's also based on God Almighty's trust in us that he will begin to show us things, tell us things, reveal certain secrets to us 
as Amos said, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. If you read Amos chapter 3, verse 7. And the psalmist also said, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will shew them his covenant. In Psalm 25, verse 14. Then another really important thing that makes certain people be very good friends of God is the fact that when they are facing certain challenges, temptations, tribulations, persecutions, etc., their relationship with him endures. If you look at many Christians in churchanity or Christendom or mainstream Christianity today, you can see that based on what they pray about and what they say, they aren't really coming to God because they want a God. It's because they want something else. It could be because they want money, you know, they want jobs, promotions, and so on. Or they generally want this world, what this world can provide. The problem with wanting God Almighty for something else apart from Him is that in certain cases, like when you go through financial difficulty or whatever, those things are normal there, then your relationship with God doesn't have a base anymore because it was not based on God. It was based on something else. But when you come to God just because you want God, God Almighty will always be God. He lives forever. If you read Psalm 90 verse 2, and he's always the person that he is. If you read Malachi chapter 3 verse 6, and so there's nothing that's going to change our relationship with him because God Almighty in the first place does not change. For example, if you look at the relationship Joel had with God, you can see that because of a spiritual contest or a bet that had taken place between God and Satan, God had allowed Satan to do a lot of terrible things to Job, which we read in Job chapter 1. Now, if Job, as Satan had said, was only worshipping God because he was wealthy and he had a lot of peace and so on, then Job would have cursed God as his foolish wife advised him to do, and the story of Job would have been completely different. But because Job was worshipping God, not because of something else, but just because of God, because he loved God, he wanted to serve God because of who he was, when a lot of those good things of life disappeared, his relationship with God didn't disappear. It was only those other physical things that did. And if you look at certain statements he made to his friends, you can tell that he wasn't interested in changing. His relationship with God was going to remain no matter what. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain my own ways before him. If you read Job chapter 13, verse 15. He also said, As God liveth, who hath taken away my judgment, and the Almighty, who hath vexed my soul, all the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. God forbid that I should justify you. Till I die, I will not remove mine integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast, I will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. If we read Job chapter 27, Verses 2 to 6. And Job was able to carry on through all that trouble and terrible things that he was suffering till the end until, as James said, he saw the end of the Lord and he was blessed with more than he had at the beginning. Then the fourth and final thing that we tend to see friends of God do is defending God's interests. Now, what I mean by defending God's interests is that there are certain times, be it maybe in our marriages or in our families or our work or any place, where the will of God is opposed. Righteousness is opposed, be it ignorantly or deliberately. If someone speaks unrighteously, maybe someone is trying to prevent us from doing what is right before God or whatever given case it is. When we stand up for righteousness, when we defend God's interests, then we are on the side of God. And then God Almighty, seeing that, is like, oh, this person's on my side. And then he brings us close to him. Now, in case you still don't get what I mean, if you look at the story of Phineas and what he did in Numbers chapter 25, you can get a sense of how you defend God's interests. When Phineas saw what the Israelites were doing. That is, that Israelite who went 
with a Midianitish woman and they were committing fornication and all that, he felt angry. And he took up a javelin or sword and killed those two people. Now, what was Phineas's business with that? He knew that God Almighty didn't like what was happening, the fornication and so on. And because he knew God didn't like it, he also didn't like it. And he was zealous for God Almighty to the point that he killed those people who were involved in the act. And God praised his zeal and love for righteousness and blessed him, saying that the priesthood would come from his lineage from that point onward. If you also look at what Paul and Barnabas did in Acts chapter 14, verses 8 to 18, you can also see how people defend God's interests. There was a time when Paul was in Lystra, and he had done a marvelous miracle by making someone who had never walked in all his life because he was lame to get up and start walking. The whole city, when they saw it, wanted to worship him, and literally oxen and animals were brought so that sacrifices could be offered to them. Now, if Paul and Barnabas were cocky and proud and disobedient, they would have enjoyed that worship, that glory and ovation, and felt nice about themselves. But they knew God would be jealous, and that was all wrong, what those people wanted to do. And so they refused to accept the worship and hastily prevented them from doing it by saying, no, don't fall with these vanities of worshiping human beings and all that. No, worship the living God. And they said more things like that. But they defended God's interests. They stood for what they knew was right before God. And those were the kinds of people who we read in the scriptures that had a very close relationship with God. So we've been able to look at a few things that make certain people tend to have a very strong bond or friendship with God Almighty. Now, if we study these characters in the scriptures and get to understand deeper how these people are able to build such a strong connection with God, sometimes we're like, I want that too. I want to be able to have that kind of relationship with God. And like I said at the beginning, it's a good desire. It's a good thing to want. But how exactly can we develop it? Well, the first thing we should do, which isn't even unique to God Almighty, is to get to know who he is. If you want to be friends with a coworker or generally this person that you admire, you want to get closer to them, the first thing is get to know that person better, what they like, what they don't like, what their life goals are, their career goals, or whatever you think will make you to understand them better. Just as you would naturally do that when you want to become friends with a human being, the same goes for God Almighty. You have to study the scriptures so that we can get a sense of who God is, what he likes and doesn't like, what he thinks is righteous and what he thinks is unrighteous, and how his general views on various matters are. Apostle Paul advised us to study the scriptures in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, so that understanding God can be one of the benefits. He said, study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Then after we study the scriptures to get to know God a little bit, then we should start meditating. Meditating or meditation is essentially thinking about God about his purpose, about his personality, about his ways, his will, his goals, his promises, everything that we read in the scriptures. Meditating is essentially thinking about them. When we think about God Almighty, two things happen. One, we are establishing constant communication with God. That is, if we meditate constantly. Paul said, pray without ceasing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. And it's mainly by meditating about him that we can be in constant communication with God so that God can send us messages and strengthen our relationship with him through the Holy Spirit. And secondly, when we meditate about God, we can harmonize in our minds all the different things we learn about God. Just as how when you want to build a relationship with a human being, for example, there are different experiences you have with that person that reveal different attributes or characteristics of that person. And then in your mind, you begin to put them all together so that you get a sense of who that person is. And meditation helps us to do that for God Almighty. We begin to put the pieces together that we get from different stories and events in the scriptures 
so that we can get a sense of who God Almighty actually is. And that was why the psalmist said in Psalm 119 verses 97 to 100 that meditation made him to be wiser than his teachers. He was able to understand God Almighty better because he was meditating or thinking about him. Then lastly, we should use certain challenges we face in our race of salvation, be it financial, emotional, or spiritual, that is, because of our faith, because of our righteous ways, we're persecuted or tempted or so on. We should use those challenges to get closer to God. Rather than when we're facing challenges, we ask God, oh, why am I facing this? If you're God, you won't let this happen. No, we use those challenges to strengthen our relationship with God. We use them to trust more in God, to rely more on God. Because just as how when you want to become friends with a human being, what really makes your friendship strong is experiences you have with that person. Not just conversations, but like actual things you do with that particular person. The same is with God. By facing challenges in our spiritual race, then our relationship with God gets stronger because we begin to trust God more, rely on God more, look to God more, walk in His ways better, and so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, after we do those three things consistently and steadfastly, then when we look at people or read about people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Jesus Christ, the apostles, and so on, who had a close relationship with God, we will be able to confidently and boldly say, I am like one of those people because I have a strong and good relationship with my Heavenly Father. And that is where I'm going to stop on discussing that subject, God's unique friends. To conclude this episode, let us hear a tune that some of us might enjoy. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this insight. We pray that you will continue to guide us through your Holy Spirit so that we may serve you with clay hands in your sight. We acknowledge that it is only by your power and grace that we can become your good friends. We desire such a relationship with you and we pray that you can Give us of your Holy Spirit and your spiritual blessings so that we can gradually come closer to you and serve you in a way that will please you. All to your honor, glory, and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, if you have enjoyed this video, then give it a like. And if you happen to learn something new today, then hit the subscribe button. And if you want to be aware when next we post, hit the notification bell. And if you found something we said in this video interesting or puzzling, you know, whatever, put it in the comment section below. Ask us questions. We'd love to help you out and answer you. And honestly, just have a discussion with you because spiritual discussions are not only beneficial, but they're entertaining because it is God Almighty we want to serve. And so talking about Him, there isn't anything better. Anyway, have a good day and God bless you.